I think one of the most special things about fashion is how what we wear can symbolize what we value within society. And the better you understand the cultural implications of certain styles, the more tactfully you can coordinate your outfits to reflect what matters to you as an individual. From my interpretation, this is exactly how the men who represent Black Ivy dress during the 50s and 60s. Black Ivy is a classification of style derived from Black men during the 20th century, who made a conscious decision to wear the pieces typically associated with upper Ivy League class elites in the US. The style, meant to subvert ideas that Blacks were lesser or less than their white counterparts, was exemplified by musicians, actors, politicians, athletes, and educators. Today, we're going to look at why I think Black Ivy is simultaneously one of the coolest and one of the most overlooked stylistic periods in American history. And I'm going to explain to you why I think Black Ivy is so important to the American fashion zeitgeist to the fashion zeitgeist as a whole for those of you who don't know me my name is drew what it do it's nice to meet you let's talk black ivy my good god almighty coca-cola and the cowboy jazz is here to stay what is black ivy most of you have probably never heard this term or heard this stylistic genre, and I had neither up until about a year or so ago. Black Ivy is a modern term used to describe the way in which blacks in the US dressed during the 50s and 60s. I had a chance to sit down and talk with the author of the book, Black Ivy, A Revolt in Style, Jason Jules, and this is what he had to say about describing the phrase or the term Black Ivy. So when I wrote the book Black Ivy, it was really talking about the way in which clothing and Ivy League clothing in its in and in of itself was adopted by civil rights activists and, that, and you know, people who are kind of agents of change. So there would be poets or jazz musicians or actors, these people who are basically agents of change. Yeah. And how they adopted that clothing and in a sense co-opted that clothing to their own ends. So yeah. essentially that's what Black Ivy is about. Black Ivy is a style derived from the idea that blacks in the US aimed to subvert ideas in America that they were lesser than their white counterparts. That's why Jason Jules calls Black Ivy a revolt in style. When I picked up Black Ivy at Drake's in Soho here in New York City, it was my goal to read the entirety of the book front to back, every single word that encapsulated the book, because I really wanted to immerse myself in this world and truly learn about what is Black Ivy. And as powerful as the imagery is in this book, the first line that's a part of the first passage of the book really stuck with me. It reads, Style is about the freedom to be oneself, to authentically express oneself, and in doing so reject limitations imposed by others. A consciousness of style, in essence, emerges when one asserts one's right to self-definition and the right to take control of one's own identity. That is the essence of Black Ivy, the freedom to be oneself and to express oneself authentically. To me, Black Ivy embodies the ethos of expression in this sense. The men and women who took it upon themselves to use fashion as a way to revolt against the mainstream society did so through the clothes they wore. One of the most powerful thoughts I had throughout reading the book was imagining being a black man in the 60s, putting on an incredibly fly looking suit or top or jacket and looking this good and still the society at large viewed me as less or as less than. When I look at these images of some of the most important, most famous black Americans, you see both their disposition to be treated as equals and you see their sublime couthness. Also, what I realized in, in a kind of in a semi-biographical way, I guess, is that there is this idea that if a, a black person is wearing that clothing and into that clothing, then it makes a lot these days, or at least in the recent past, there's this assumption that they're not as committed to, you know, their blackness as other people who wouldn't be wearing those clothes. The, the idea is that they're aspiring to the, the Ivy League lifestyle as opposed to their own personal journeys. Yeah. And so I think one of the, the, the reasons that I wanted to write the book and, and the kind of story is relevant is that it's not really just about the past, it's about understanding 
you know, identity now and the idea that we don't necessarily have to subscribe to what the mainstream tells us is, you know, kind of consensually accepted as a black appearance as blackness. or a black style. Yeah, totally. And we have to question where that comes from, if you know what I mean. The clothing most associated with Black Ivy included a lot of traditional Ivy classics, from tweed blazers to seersucker tops, button-down collars, and wingtip shoes. Ivy style is similar in a lot of ways with what we would call modern prep or preppy styles today. The biggest difference between Black Ivy and Ivy is the flair that Blacks brought to the stylistic genre. Incorporating workwear fabrics like denim is one of the largest examples of how blacks brought a different kind of flair to what Ivy was traditionally doing. Workwear being typically not associated with Ivy style until much, much later. In addition to that, the musical and cultural connotations with Black Ivy brought an entirely unique energy to the clothing that was not previously seen. Another one of my favorite examples in the book of how it explained the flair that Blacks brought to Black Ivy in contrast to Ivy, American Ivy. The book talks specifically about the use of sunglasses as a subtle style cue used as a symbol for the rejection of the outside world. In Black Ivy, a revolting style, it states, the popularity of sunglasses here has a direct correlation to the beats and bebop generation. Wearing sunglasses outdoors, indoors, during the day or night showed a kind of detachment, if not disdain for the outside world. When I flipped through the pages of Black Ivy, I observed a distinct nonchalant coolness in the feel of a lot of the clothing being worn. To me, this is prevalent in a lot of the photos that we see from the 20th century. My favorite outfit in the entire book belongs to James Baldwin in this shearling coat. Not necessarily something that I would wear, but damn, James looks really, really good in this. One of the coolest things about Black Ivy, A Revolt in Style, the book, is being able to see all of these really famous and really noteworthy icons within the black community have their style broken down meticulously. From the likes of Miles Davis to Sidney Portier to Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane, I mean, the list goes on and on and on in this book. There are truly a lot of very, very cool nods and mentions and style inspirations and just things that you can look at as a result of just flipping through the book. I think holistically, personally, I was most drawn to Gordon Park's style and his showcasing in the book. Also, Sonny Rollins and Sidney Portier were a chef's kiss when it comes to how they were showcased as well. The skillfulness of the photography used to capture these men in this book is second to none. You really got a sense of what it felt like to wear these clothes all these years ago. Unofficially, Miles Davis seems to be the most important figurehead in this book. He is the cover of Black Ivy, and his style is one of the best representations of revolt. No, not even that. Who, in your opinion, are some of the more pivotal agents of change that you get, you decided to highlight, you and your partner decided to highlight in yeah. Black Ivy? Um, Miles Davis, definitely, like without any question, because he, number one, on the most kind of obvious level, he had an amazing style throughout his life and career. He saw the kind of the connection between his all his creative aspects from painting to clothing to music mm. to performance all of those things were like a conscious construct and he was fully aware of what he was doing and unapologetic about it as well and also because he came from a black ivy background you know his, his dad had a pig farm his dad was super wealthy you know his dad was like a, a physician so miles knew about those clothes miles had no fear of of and as he evolved his his style was always true to himself there's a level of authenticity about him that yeah. continued as a, as a through line and again his music was was kind of fearless in that's in the same respect so i think for me the, one of the most important people was Mars, and that's kind of why graham and, and the publishers suggested that he be on the cover and when we found that image it was there was no question i have so many stories to tell about miles davis and one of my favorite ones is
Jason would also state that the irony is that while many black Ivyists adopted the style in order to be perceived as acceptable in the eyes of the mainstream, they instead managed to heighten the perceived differences by giving the style an edge and attitude that it would have otherwise lacked. I think it's important to note that those who were represented as black Ivyists in the book don't encompass all of what black Ivy is and were what it was during the time period that it existed in. Black Ivy, from what I'm understanding, is about the reimagining of what it means to be black in America. It is an example of self-determination by the black community in an effort to show blacks deserve equal treatment. Two of the most important examples in the book were the athletes Jason Jules decided to highlight. As someone who played sports in both high school and college, I've always felt that sports and fashion go hand in hand. And the archives of Black Ivy seem to agree with me on that. Muhammad Ali, one of the examples in the book, is a literal textbook example of Black Ivy. But one of the athletes that I had honestly not known much about was Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe was a promising black tennis player who dressed in Black Ivy and performed wonderfully in his sport. Extra side nugget about Arthur Ashe that I forgot to mention, Arthur became the first African American man to capture the US Open in 1968. That's huge. But Arthur Ashe was not allowed to become a member at the majority of the clubs he played at because of his race. For some reason, these sports stories resonate with me on such a deep level. And I think the biggest reason why they resonate with me so much is because they remind me of how far my forefathers and all of the blacks who sacrificed and put in time and, and went through really horrendous things, how much they went through to allow me to be in the position where I'm at, being able to talk to an audience of people from around the world because I extracted my confidence from these stories to play sports and then to go to college and then to make YouTube videos and try to be another example of hope and inspiration for other people's lives. Arthur Ashe is a great example of how far we've come as it pertains to rights, equality, and freedom of expression. And even if you're not African or of African-American descent or black, there is a powerful lesson that can be applied to you as well. That lesson is, your worth is not defined by others imposed ideas about you. Your worth is defined by what you believe about yourself and the value you bring to others around you. Let's get a word in for today's sponsor, Squarespace. Are you interested in making your very own website for a brand or creative project? Squarespace offers a comprehensive amount of features to help you create the website that you've always wanted. If you want to sell your products direct to consumer, or if you want to showcase your body of work, Squarespace makes it easy to do that and more. Currently, I'm using my Squarespace website as a hub for all of my content and as a way to direct those interested to my podcast and social media. If you needed a sign to help nudge you into creating your first website, this is your sign. Visit squarespace.com slash drewjoiner for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Let's get into the criticisms. One of the main criticisms of Black Ivy is that essentially it's an appropriation of the popular style at the time, which was American Ivy. Essentially, Black Ivy technically is just an extension of American Ivy. And as the book mentioned, and if you understand the history, after the death of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., there is a noticeable shift that took place amongst Black America's cultural agents of change. Through the rise of hippie culture, the Black Panther Party, and the counterculture movement, the Black Ivy style faded a bit in the 70s. One of the most logical questions that I've received from both Blacks and non-Blacks and just everyone is, was Black Ivy actually real? Because it just seems like, well, this is the way people dressed in the 50s and 60s, and of course, black people just dressed in the same exact way. So why is it called Black Ivy? Why is there no Italian Ivy? Or why is there no you know, other genres of Ivy based on race? What do you think Black Ivy communicated in the 20th century? I know you kind of touched on this a little bit. And then how would you contrast that to what Black Ivy communicates now in 2024? I mean, as what it communicates now, I'm not. I'm not sure, you know, I, would, I was going to ask you that same question. Sure. Um, I think at the time, it was definitely a challenge to people's ideas of what, you know, a black person should be 
kind of aspiring to in terms of clothing. I think there's a lot of people who poke at this idea that Black Ivy as a term and as a concept is modernist revisionist history, meaning that it's an interpretation of how people used to dress, but there's an association that didn't exist during the time, but we now have created an association because we want there to be some kind of value that derives from why people dress the way they dress during that time period. One of the comments that I stumbled across talking about Black Ivy was this one from a New York Times article. This comment, however accurate you take it for, gives a real world account of the genres of style most seen in the 50s. To this person, there was the hustler style, the continental style, and then you had the Ivy style. Contrasting that with the genres of style available today, things have truly changed. But one of the most important reflections that I had while reading Black Ivy was reflecting on my personal identity as a African American, as a black African American in 2024. When I was in school, um, I went to school with, uh, you know, what I would say is a accurate breakdown of what the percentage of race would be in the U.S. So like you have majority of the kids in my school are white kids. Then you have another portion who are Hispanic, Latina, Latino, whatever it may be. Another portion that are black, another portion that are Native American, Pacific Island, whatever it may be. Right. I remember, you know, and just as a lot of people understand culture and understand identity. There was a subset of kids in my school who looked quote unquote black, if that makes sense, right? Whatever that idea is in your head, right? They they maybe they maybe at the time during the mid 2000s or 20 teens is when I was in high school, they they dressed in a particular way. They wore particular shoes. They had a particular uh, vernacular speech that they spoke with. Um, and a lot of people associated that with blackness for the schools that I went to. For me, uh, I was always kind of how you said earlier on, so when it was just a deviation away, right? Just a little bit different from what you would traditionally associate with a particular image of a group of people. And I remember a lot, because I played sports, I remember a lot of times from my teammates to other black kids in the school, they would always say like one particular thing to me, like Drew, like we like you, whatever it is, we're friends. Like I was friends with a lot of people, but they would always say, you just, you just don't sound black. You just don't act black. That to me, it was something that I got a lot as a young person growing up. And it's something that that stuck with me because it always made me think about what does it mean to be black? And what does it mean when you're saying, whether you're uh, another black person or African-American person, that you don't see me as the same as you? It's just very, very fascinating because I think it goes back to this idea of what media and what kind of like social mental thoughts, I don't know how to say it, how we think about what it means to be black as I've gotten older. I think that more less and less people say that they just view my blackness as a form of who I am. It's not it's not a matter of you're not black, you're black, whatever it is. But as a young person, there's still this like I felt this very strong push from a, from my peers that, you know, you're not black. You're not you you don't act like one of us. And you know, there would be moments where, of course, there would be moments oh, like, yeah, he is black. He does do these kind of things. And then there'd be moments he's not because I'm into, you know, Japanese anime and there's certain TV shows and certain music and things like that. So but now, I mean, obviously in 2024, everything's cool. Everything's fine. But when I was a kid, I just felt that when I flip through the pages of Black Ivy and I look at all of these beautiful examples of menswear and American Ivy and Black Ivy and these really great styles, I can't help but be drawn to wanting to dress like this. As I was talking to Jason on my podcast about identity and what identity means to me, I realized that one of the biggest goals of this channel is to offer as a source of inspiration for those who feel out of place within their own identity. For a lot of years of my youth, I felt out of place and I found it difficult to express myself as a young black boy coming up in an ever complicated world. I still struggle to this day, all the time. But but that is why I gravitated towards fashion and clothing as a way to better explain who I am to the world and to prove to the world that my existence is valuable. To prove that where I come from and what my creativity yields is something that is worth taking note of. Being black in America will always come with some level of emotional or psychological baggage, but so will being white, Latinx, Asian, Native American, or whatever X identifier you want to use 
to quantify a human being. What the individuals in Black Ivy aim to do and what I aim to do is to subvert negative ideas upheld by individuals who judge me online or in person or wherever they may judge me and to forge my own path with kindness, with openness, with forgiveness, and with a little bit of grace while looking damn good in the process. That is kind of the crux. That is the ultimate, the the lesson that I learned from taking a look at Black Ivy or Revolt in Style and talking to Jason Jules. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about Black Ivy the ideas presented down in the comments. And if you liked the video, make sure to give it a like. And if you really liked it, subscribe. As always, I'm spreading peace, love, and positivity in 2024. So that means I'm spreading peace, love, and positivity to you and more. Wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful rest of your day. A bientôt. Peace. Yo, what is good post vid vid? Hopefully you're having a wonderful day today. Here is the fist bump. Bop. Gotta get two of those things in. Come on. Give me, give me a second fist bump right here. Bop. Thank you so much for staying to the end of the video. I appreciate you immensely. Post vid vid. I want to ask you guys, have you or did you, did you know about Black Ivy before watching this video? Have you heard about it before? Do you know about it before? Just curious to know your kind of level of understanding of what Black Ivy is or was before reading it. If you haven't picked up the book, I highly recommend it. It's over there on my shelf right now. Really, really cool book. Jason Jules was awesome. Um, for me, it was like the next step from Amatura to Black Ivy. And then I'm going to do American Ivy. And I'm going to go through this entire Ivy circuit. I know the there's an Articles of Interest podcast that kind of recounts things really, really well. But I kind of want to put my footnote, my stamp on Black Ivy. So see you guys in next week's video. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Talk soon. Bye.